a slew of sayings Christians shouldn't say. <laughs> it's Don Friel, boing! And I, with my levitational power, so if you're here today and you thought, I can't be forgiven, I'm too bad of a sinner, you don't know how good of a Savior Jesus is. No matter who you are, no matter what you have done, where sin did abound, grace abounds that much more. Hello, and welcome to Wretched. My name is Todd Friel. I am your host, the wretch the song refers to uh, cliches. Evangelical Christianity, we've got a slew of them, don't we? Ask Jesus into your heart. Make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Make a decision for the Lord. We love cliches, and there ain't nothing wrong with a cliche as long as it's biblical. Unfortunately, many of them are not. And we have, for your consideration, a slew, and I think that's the right word, a slew of sayings that Christians probably shouldn't say. Starting with the classic, God helps those who help themselves. Perhaps you've heard it said that God helps those who help themselves, which is arguably the most quoted verse not found in the Bible. The quote is often attributed to Benjamin Franklin written in Poor Richard's Almanac, but an earlier appearance shows up in 1698 in an article entitled Discourses Concerning Government written by Algernon Sidney. That's just a bonus fact for you there. God helps those who help themselves is not anywhere in Scripture. The Bible actually instructs us to rely fully on the Lord and not on ourselves. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Proverbs 28, 26 even says, whoever trusts in his own mind trusts in a fool. And as we read in Jeremiah 17, 5, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Our works do not earn God's favor. As the prophet Isaiah said, even our best deeds are like filthy rags. Romans 3.10 says that there is none righteous, not even one. The only work that God accepts as righteous is the work that Christ completed on the cross. The wages of sin is death, Scripture says, and Christ took that penalty upon himself. All who are in Christ Jesus, God looks upon as righteous, not because of what we did, but because of what Christ did and is still doing in us. As it says in Titus 3.5, he saved Saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. So God does not help those who help themselves. He comes to those who humble themselves. Have you ever uttered anything that resembles this? I'm just at the end of my rope. There's just nothing I can do. I just don't, it's all out of my control. I don't think that I can do anything to make this situation better. If that sounds like anything you have ever uttered. Congratulations! You're right where God wants you. Uh, quick caveat, this is not to suggest we just let go and let God another evangelical cliche that needs to go away. We get to work on the issue recognizing, I ain't going to fix this because without Christ I can do nothing. If you've ever found yourself let's say despairing because you just didn't think that you could make this situation better. Now your theology is spot on because you can't do anything to make this better. You can't do anything without God. If you kind of like that cliche that God helps those who help themselves, I would like to suggest to you it needs to vamoose. And if you think, well, what, how am I ever going to get through this situation? The answer is not you. The answer is not you helping yourself. God's going to get the credit for doing everything. And when we are feeling like there ain't nothing I can do to make this better, that's exactly the place where God wants us. Got a question for you. Did you see another cliche in that video? It was the, here's man on one side of the cliff and here's God on the other and there's a big crevice and you're gonna fall into that ravine because your works can't get you there. Maybe you've even seen that illustration where somebody tries to jump and he gets out about two feet. Somebody tries to jump, gets out about four feet, but they all fall short of the glory of God. 
would like to suggest to you that too is a cliche that needs to go away. Our situation is far more dire than falling into a ravine. Here's what that illustration is missing. Something up here, and that something would be God. And it's his wrath that is aimed at us. We're, we're not just going to try our best and let Jesus do the rest. We're not going to really run at this thing super hard and maybe we'll get there. Uh uh. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. Furthermore, if it's if it's just a cross that somehow is crossing that divide, how do I get to the other side? How do I get to God in that illustration? And it is not by walking. That too would be work righteousness. Instead, a better drawing would be, here I am in a heap, toast, or if you're German, tote. I'm just dead. I ain't got no chance to get to God. But Jesus makes us alive. And to work with the illustration, he's the one who brings us to God. I do nothing. I don't run and jump. I don't walk to get there. I don't cross the cross. Instead, my Savior makes me alive. And in Christ, I am reconciled to God. Now, I know probably pretty difficult to make that drawing. Well, let's sacrifice a drawing for good theology, because any time we start to get sloppy around the edges, well, there can be all kinds of consequences. Next on Wretched. Hi, Todd. My name is Nathan. I'm from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I'm a Wretched Radio listener. I'm here in Eastern Ukraine with Tomorrow Clubs to teach English and to teach the children about the Bible. Thank you very much for what you do. Way to go, Nathan. Perhaps you'd like to take a trip to, say, Ukraine to start a Tomorrow Club. And if you don't want to go that far, just go to tomorrowclubs.org slash wretched and you could support your own Tomorrow Club. Welcome back to a wretched cliche fest. Perhaps you have said or used the cliche, preach the gospel. And if necessary, use a mission ball. What? A popular quote about sharing the gospel goes like this. Preach the gospel always, if necessary, use words. The quote is attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. It was even the inspiration behind an award-winning gospel music album. First of all, there is no record that St. Francis ever said this. Secondly, it isn't biblical. The quote is often used to argue that actions are the primary tool for sharing the gospel, while words are merely a backup. But that's not the gospel. The word gospel means good news. It must be declared. In Matthew 28, when Jesus commissioned his disciples to go and make more disciples, he told them to teach. And that's exactly what they did. In Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, the disciples went into Jerusalem and did what? Made sure everyone saw them and miming the gospel? No, they went in and verbally preached about the events concerning Christ's death and resurrection. And 3,000 people were baptized that day. In Romans 10, the Apostle Paul tells the church to confess with their mouths. He writes, how will they believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? So the quote is true in the sense that it is necessary to use words, but false if the quote is being used to say that our actions are all the gospel we need. The gospel of Jesus Christ is history, a message that must be spoken. Our actions affirm that we truly believe in what we speak. So live a life of godliness. Preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. Is this foolish? How foolish is it? Two, three, four. What? What's the problem? Do a talk show, and if necessary, talk. <laughs> People can't understand the gospel unless we do use words. What is the delight that some people seem to take in this cliche that we should preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words? I think 
It gets us off the hook of evangelism. I know it is hard to start a spiritual conversation. In fact, it's probably the hardest part, just getting going, springboarding from the secular into the spiritual. It's really hard. And this cliche, which is not biblical, I think it just gets us off the hook. I'll wait for somebody to ask me because I'm looking so Christian. Got a question for you. What does that look like exactly? <laughs> There's plenty of pagans who clean up just fine. They look entirely pleasant, but that doesn't communicate anything. Now, if you think, well, I'm just going to live in such a way that people ask me about the hope that lies within me. Now, while I understand that, you're going to be waiting a long time or even worse. A number of years ago, Kirk Cameron told a story of him trying to apply, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. He was doing a movie someplace, and they were being taken from their trailers to the set. And on the bus, there was another actress with him, and he wanted to preach the gospel to her without using words. I'm going to do my best impression of what Kirk tried to do so that she would ask him about the hope that lies within him. In other words, he tried to look a lot like Jim Caviezel, try to come up with this ethereal look like, oh, I'm kind of on a different plane and don't I look peaceful? The actress looked at him and said, you okay? You look like you might be getting sick. Yes, everything. Did you eat the tuna? What happened? Didn't work at all. I get it. It's hard to start a spiritual conversation. But what does Romans 10 tell us? How will they hear unless a preacher goes and a preacher doesn't do mime? You don't communicate the gospel by being stuck in a box, which is sin, and only Jesus can somehow get you out. You need to use words to summon up the courage and get yourself into the conversation. Well, what's this doing here? It's a mission ball. This is for you if you are going on a missions trip. Now, remember, a missions trip, by definition, is to be sent, to be missioed, and to actually preach the gospel. Now, if you want to go dig wells, that's fine. But that's a mission of mercy. But it's not a missions trip. It's doing nice things, and that's nice, but that isn't really a missions trip. By definition, we go to proclaim the gospel. This is a great way to get the conversation started. I, I think I've been familiar with the mission ball for 15 years. <laughs> Just Tory Babb does such a great job with this. This is a soccer ball. Bring this to Argentina or Venezuela or any place where they've tried socialism and they're desperately poor because that's always the result of socialism. With all due respect to Jim Carrey, who thinks that we should just go ahead and become a socialist nation. That was a political aside, absolutely free. The mission ball gathers attention. I mean, you take it out of the box, of course, but bring this to a field in a country where people are poor, they love soccer. This will assemble a crowd. This isn't just a one-on-one -on -one sort of thing. It will absolutely, it will gather people because they want it. So you use their covetousness to actually read what's on the soccer ball. It comes in about a gazillion languages. So you can, you can visit themissionball.org, themissionball.com. Visit the Mission Ball website, and you can find this in the language of the nation that you're going to, and then just gather a crowd around and just read the thing. Now, as you can see, it's got tons of ink. And by the way, Tori worked with the University of Minnesota to come up with an ink that cannot be kicked off. Not kidding. And so, for instance, it has the Ten Commandments. And it, and it goes through them so people can understand they're a sinner. It talks about God's Word. This is like sort of like a magic eight ball in the box. I think I'm just going to keep it here. And then it's got God's plan of salvation. Here's what it reads. Just, I'll just be the little bouncing ball. The most important question of your life 
is, will you go to heaven when you die? God says, in order to go to heaven, you must be born again. Quotes the Bible. It's littered with Bible verses. It opens up the law. It talks about Jesus dying for sinners. It even defines repentance and faith. It is a great gospel presentation. Whether you're going overseas, third world country or not, you might want to consider this or consider, well, frankly, anything else. Consider any sort of thing that you can use where you feel comfortable. Don't stub your toe. A lot of people are using that these days to simply give gospel literature to somebody and say, hey, did you get one of these yet? Hey, have you read this yet? Hey, this is my last one, but it's just for you. And whatever the means is, just preach the gospel. And it is necessary to use words. But perhaps you're thinking, well, if I'm that heavenly minded, I'm not going to be of any earthly good. Next on Wretched. Listening to Wretched Radio will make you better at baseball. Listening to Wretched Radio will make you better at basketball. Swish. Listening to Wretched Radio will make you better at horse whispering. Listening to Wretched Radio will make your life perfect. Can we promise that your life will be fantastic? Why not? False teachers do it all the time. So tune in daily to Wretched Radio, and you will soon be a billionaire. She was probably going to have an abortion because her boyfriend was pressuring her, but she took with her a little baby bag that we gave every client. And when she got home, she told us that her boyfriend took out the little fetal model that we would put in each bag. He said, I don't think we should abort this baby. For just $28 a month, you could provide a free ultrasound and we could see more stories like that. Please visit preborn.org slash wretched. Welcome back to a wretched cliche fest. We have oodles of them. Perhaps you've even heard or mm, use this cliche yourself. What? Don't be so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good. Have you ever heard that expression before? It is a lie from the pit of hell. More accurately, don't be so earthly minded that you're of no heavenly good. Jesus said to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things you need will be added to you. The writer of Hebrews said to desire a heavenly city. For here on earth we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Paul wrote to the Galatians to hold to the promise of the Jerusalem from above. And he told the Colossians, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Flip flop. Yes, we're aware of what we're doing on this planet. Yes, we prepare for the future. Yes, you make a bag lunch to bring to the office so you can eat at noon. We don't just let go and let God. Having said that, our thoughts should regularly, not perpetually, you can't do that. You probably can't even drive well if you're just thinking ethereal thoughts, but regularly our minds should be fixed on not this life, but the afterlife. This is not some sort of placebo that we take. It is reorienting our thinking to remember this thing is a vapor. It is going to go foom, like the morning fog, which is the exact sound that morning fog makes. There, I saw a special on Nat Geo, and they've got a fogometer that indicates foom, is the sound fog makes when it disappears, which is exactly what that cliche should do. But it does beg a question. How do you do that? How do you think about the better things, which is what the book of Hebrews is all about. Jesus is the better thing. And what he's done for us in salvation is the better thing. The place where we're going, it's a better thing than this life. There's only one way to become more heavenly minded. And that is to read the book that talks about heaven. Okay, there's another book. You could get Randy Elkhorn's Heaven because it's a study of the word on heaven. And I'm telling you, when you're done with this book, you're going to want to go there like now 
because it's going to be so amazing. Have you pondered what heaven might be like? Remember, we're not going to be flying off to a cloud someplace. When Jesus returns, he's going to torch this place. Just burn it all up. This set, your home, anything that you've put your hand to, the trees outside your window, obliterated with fire because this is all a cursed planet and he's going to cleanse it with fire. But then he doesn't whisk us off to start playing a harp full time. He's going to create a new heaven and a new earth like this place. Here's a question for you. Do you think the new heavens and the new earth will have less than this place? It doesn't make sense, does it? Randy Elkhorn bring this out magnificently in his book, Heaven. You're not going to get a mind swipe. You're not going to go to heaven and go, oh, I wonder what I did when I was alive on the planet. It's not like you're going to bump into family members and go, so what's your name? Want to go to the banquet and hang out a little bit and learn something about each other? You're not going to lose your memory. And I'd also suggest to you, you're going to be doing the stuff that you love only better. Thorns and thistles, that's what this planet is. Work, every time something goes kafritz, every time everything in the home is acrimonious, thorns and thistles because of the curse. But please remember that Adam, Eve, were, they were assigned a job before the fall. They were told to subdue the earth. It needs tending. It requires labor. And that means I believe that you and I will be doing works in eternity. What? What are you talking about? We're, we're just going to be feeding the poor? No, that's not going to be an issue. I suspect, now this is, this is using a heavenly imagination, but I suspect the planet's going to be, well, it's going to have trees and fauna and it'll have all kinds of animals, I think, in the, in the new heavens and the new earth. I don't think there's going to be less than what there is now. And I think we're going to have to start by building it up. Now we know that there's a city. It's the heavenly city. But the rest of the things that we see now, I think that we're going to get to work on perhaps recreating even better. Why will they be better? Not because we're going to be more brilliant per se, but because we're going to do it with the right motivation. We're not going to build a skyscraper to demonstrate, look what men can do. We're building our way to the heavens. Look at how accomplished we are. Now we're going to do everything because look at what Jesus has done for us. So I believe you're going to be working, but with the right motive. I believe that there will be arts. There will be entertainment. We just won't be consumed by it. We'll do it all for the glory of God. You say, I like eating and cooking. Why wouldn't that exist in heaven? I suspect it's going to be a lot tastier. In fact, in Luke 13, we hear that there is going to be a heavenly banquet prepared for the reception of the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. And guess who the servant at this magnificent banquet is going to be? Jesus Christ himself is going to serve the servants. Ponder that for a minute and you will stop being so earthly minded. You're of no heavenly good. Think about the amazing things that Jesus has done for us, what he's going to do for us. And you then, with that information in your brain, you'll want to preach the gospel and you'll realize it's necessary to use words and you'll actually use them. Surprise, next on Wretched. Todd, I was given out a Bible to a woman, the former village witch doctor. And she took that Bible from me, of course, had the biggest smile on her face. And she held it above her head. And 10 times she said, louder each time, I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm a new creation in Christ. For just $5 a Bible, you could write a story just like that. So may I ask you, how many stories could you write? Visit wretched.org slash Bible. A testimony from Amy. Dear Mr. 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 Friel. All right, please, if you're going to write in, it's Mr. 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 Friel to you. Amy writes this, I'm very, very grateful to God for your ministry. God has brought you into my life at the perfect time. Everything is and your daily companionship and wisdom 
has been life-saving and life-changing. God bless you, Amy. God bless you, Amy. And may God bless our gospel partners, which make testimonies like this even possible. It is only because of your ongoing monthly support that we get to hear from people that this ministry is affecting. Would you please become a gospel partner at wretched.org slash donate. The issue with TMAI is, is very simple. Biblical training. Training men to be the kinds of pastors that are defined and described in the New Testament. If you would like to make a great investment, please consider supporting the Master's Academy International training indigenous pastors to be expositors in 16 different countries. TMAI.org slash wretched. Welcome back to a wretched surprise. Two words, heavenly athletics. Question, do you think in the afterlife there might be sports competitions? My question for you, again, this is based on Randy Alcorn's, I, I think the way that he has this positioned helps us so much to understand what's in store for us. There'll be no less in heaven than there is on earth. Sports competitions are not innately sinful. We turn them into a sinful mess when we score the touchdown and we run away from all of our players as if to say, give me the glory, and not to say thank you to a team. None of that will exist, but why can't athletics exist? I think we're going to be playing sports, stuff that we love. Maybe we'll even continue to invent new sports. Why wouldn't we? We invent new stuff. Now, that's not sinful if done rightly. Why wouldn't we be inventing new things to enjoy in heaven? Remember, activities that we tend to do on earth tend to keep our minds off of God and distract us and amuse us, not so in heaven. Instead, we're going to do athletic competitions the way that God would have us do them mindful that he's given us the bodies, he's given us the strength, the skills, the ball to use, whatever it is that we're going to be using. And it's all from him and for him and through him and to him. And so we'll compete without cheating. That won't happen because that's a sin. But maybe you're thinking, no, we can't do sports because somebody's going to lose. Right. But that's not a sin. I think there'll be different people with different skill sets. There'll be people who think better in heaven than let. Again, why would it be different in heaven than it is on earth? All that to say, use a sanctified imagination, but it ain't a bad thing to be thinking heavenly thoughts so that you become more earthly good. Let's see who won something, shall we? Congratulations to Leonardo Ehrenstein. Stein? Sorry, Leonardo. Untethered, you could win too. Simply visit wretched.org, subscribe to the free Wretched newsletter, and your name might appear there, and I could butcher that too. And until tomorrow, go serve your king. Thank you for watching Wretched TV, a donor supported television program. If you've benefited from Wretched, would you consider supporting our ministry? Your tax deductible gift allows us to preach amazing grace. Thank you.